We're going to take a look at trunking now, something you may have done with switches before and not had to know any of this stuff. However, to troubleshoot trunks, to connect certain kinds of trunks, and definitely to pass your CSET and CCNA exams, you're going to need to know this information about trunking switches. I'll also tell you why you might not have had to know any of it to actually get one to work, but that's coming later. Trunking, though, what is it to begin with? We're just creating a logical connection between two physically connected switches, which allows frames to flow between them. Nothing fancy going on here. We got switch one, we got switch two, we got a cable connecting the two, and technically we would have to use a crossover cable for that. If our switches support auto sense, we could use a straight through cable, but for our theory, we know we need a crossover cable. Now a tag indicating the destination VLAN is going to be put into the frame by the transmitting switch. And the receiving switch uses that frame, that value, that frame tagging to see which VLAN should receive the frame. And this allows members in the same VLAN to communicate while physically attached to different switches. Because we know, especially in real world networking and probably on the exam as well, we're going to have hosts on different switches be in the same VLANs. Now we need a little help from a trunking protocol to build the trunk. Not all Cisco switches support both of the protocols we're about to talk about, but your CSENT and CCNA studies definitely do. We know that if we have two protocols that do the same thing and there are differences between the two, which there are, we know that is fertile ground for exam questions. So let's take a close look at each of these, starting with ISL, the inter-switch protocol. ISL is Cisco proprietary. If that's your first time seeing that phrase, get used to it because we've got a couple of different Cisco proprietary services you'll run into during your studies. And it just simply means that only Cisco devices can use it. So non-Cisco switches cannot use ISL. The thing is though, many Cisco switch models don't support ISL either. And that happened to me with a switch I got once and I expected it to run both of these protocols and I went in and I only saw one available. And I was like, well, where's ISL? And the thing is, that switch model didn't support it. You're just so used to switches that supported both, but they don't do that anymore. One big reason for ISL not being particularly popular is the amount of overhead you get with it because it encapsulates the entire frame before sending it across the trunk. That might not sound that bad, but compared to the other major trunking protocol, IEEE 802.1Q, uh, which doesn't do anything like that, you have much greater overhead with ISL. Also, ISL does not recognize the concept of the native VLAN. And if you don't know what that is, I'm going to clear that up for you in about 20 seconds. But right now, we're going to talk about .1Q. This is another phrase you should look for on your exams, and you'll see it in uh, white papers and things online as well, industry standard, and that means that everybody can use it. So .1Q, the industry standard trunking protocol, it can be used by non-Cisco and Cisco switches alike. It does not encapsulate the frame like ISL does. Instead, what it does, it inserts a four byte value indicating the VLAN ID into the ethernet header. So we're talking about a lot less overhead. Just the encapsulation and the de-encapsulation is extra work for the switches. And .1Q recognizes the native VLAN concept. So enough about that. What the heck is the native VLAN concept? It's very simple. It's simply the default VLAN. Native VLAN is just another way to say default VLAN. We know that the default VLAN, the native VLAN by default on a Cisco switch, it's VLAN 1. That's going to be backed up by a couple of show commands we run on the switches here shortly. The thing is, the bad guys know that too, and that information can actually be used against us, and it's something we'll, we'll get back in touch with on when we're talking about securing our switches later on. Now, .1Q, the thing is about it recognizing the native VLAN, it's like that's fine, but what happens if it does? Well, when .1Q sees that a frame is destined for the native VLAN, and the two switches need to agree on what native VLAN is, what number it is, then .1Q won't even put that little 4-byte value into the Ethernet header. It's just going to send the frame totally untagged. And when the remote switch receives an untagged frame, it says, oh, okay, I know this frame is destined for the native VLAN, and the frame is then forwarded accordingly. That's why the switches have to agree on the native VLAN, because otherwise that wouldn't even work. 
Now, ISL, um, as my father would say, does not know a native VLAN from a hole in the ground. And for those of you who don't speak that language, <laughs> it, uh, it just means it doesn't know what a native VLAN is and it doesn't care. It just encapsulates every single frame before it's sent across the trunk, whether it's for the native VLAN or not. So ISL, again, is delivering a lot of overhead that we'd rather not have. What we're going to do now is move our focus a bit from the trunk to the ports at the end of the trunk. And that's liable to be a long discussion, so actually we'll pick up with that at the beginning of the very next video.